Hey everybody, welcome to the 24-hour marketing master one hangout where we're going to have an awesome hangout today. Uh, we have a really special guest we want to introduce you to, but before we get to that, I just wanted to introduce the panel to you so that you know who's on here. Uh, we have uh, Katie Stage, as you can see. Say hi, Katie. Hi. Okay, Katie. And Katie, Katie, Katie does the moderating, so she's going to be looking at that. And then we have uh, Steve, also in South Africa. Steve, say hey to everyone. Hey, what's up, guys? Good to be here. And we have a very special guest joining us today. Her name is Tracy Walker. And Tracy Walker has a very interesting um, story. Uh, she is a million dollar earner with Empower Network. And we are so privileged to have her on here today. I'm super excited. I know a lot of people watching are. And I just wanted to say, Tracy, I'm so glad that you could be here. Uh, I, I know that um, you're the first female to um, hit a million dollars in Empower Network. And uh, you've had quite an interesting past because you've come from uh, bankruptcy to being a seven-figure earner. And, uh, you know, you've done a whole lot of stuff. And I really just wanted to ask you um, from people watching, because I know a lot of people here uh, don't seem to think that it's possible to get to where you are. And one of the things that I really was inspired by when I heard you speaking in Nashville, when I was watching the live stream, was, hello, hello, is um, that you mentioned that you were psychologically unemployable. And the moment you said that, it really, it became so true for me because it was the one word I was looking for that I couldn't find because I really can't do that anymore. I've gone to a stage now with this business that uh, everything runs on autopilot and, uh, you know, I'm earning an income with this business. And when you said that, it inspired me to write a blog post straight away and tell people about that. And I've been telling everybody um, that I'm psychologically unemployable. But also the fact that I come from a country where it's impossible, uh, or it seems impossible, to, to be able to produce results. And I really wanted you to kind of just tell us where you come from, what is your story, because people may not know who you are. And if so, get out of the rock you're living in and, uh, you know, get to know who Tracy is because she's got a wealth of information. And Tracy, if you wouldn't mind just taking it away for us. Sure. Well, first, um Dave, I want to say thank you so much for having me and asking me to to share my story with your viewers and um, you guys' as audience. And um, I am always humbled when I have have the opportunity to do so. Uh, and just so for everybody watching, if I am moving around, you know, I just want people to know I'm attentive, uh, but I've got a little guy right right here. And so. You know, 17 months, we're jumping off the couch. We're, you know, we're doing all types of things at the blink of an eye, right? So, so I, I'm going to do my best to stay, you know, eyes here, but I will be able to communicate and move forward even if I'm kind of, you know, like, get this out of your mouth. Uh, even if, if I'm kind of, you know, talking to two people at once. So please hey, just yeah. know I that's love you guys. Fine. Right? That's fine. Okay. Um, but I... Um, I'm originally from um, Chicago, Illinois, uh, here in the States, and um, I don't have, you know, one of those stories growing up like, you know, my parents were there. I mean, they got divorced, but, I mean, they were both, you know, still there. Nobody hurt me. I wasn't homeless. Um, I got good grades in school. Uh, I, I was in dance class and volleyball team and swim team and, you know, all the extracurriculars, uh, extracurricular activities I participated in, well-rounded. Um, so then I went to, I graduated and then I went to university. Hi. Um, okay, Pumpkin, over at um, Florida a and University down in Tallahassee, Florida. And there I studied business. Uh, and then I graduated with a master's degree in business with a concentration in marketing. And uh, my goal at that time was to become a, a corporate success story. I wanted to climb the, the, the corporate ladder and I wanted to be, I don't know, maybe a chief marketing officer or really high in that, in that realm. And then when I graduated, I didn't have a job right away, right? So, so then the, the question started, right? I mean, I was all of 22 and I'm like, all right, <laughs> something already doesn't seem quite right here, but okay, we'll go along with it. 
And um, so I waited a whole year, and then I got a position in Atlanta. So I moved from Florida at that time up uh, here to Atlanta and started working at an energy trading company. And uh, that company was like a um, on-the-floor trading, right? So we didn't trade financials. We traded commodities, right, like energy, power, things like that. So it was on the open trading floor. Uh, and then September the 11th, uh, 2000. One happened. Uh, I was actually at work that morning, and we had these, you know, big, huge, like four 60-inch screens on one end of the hall, on the end of the trading floor, then another four on the other side. So we were, all, the news was always blaring, right, where I worked. Um, and so after that, after those events, what happened was a lot of companies were affected. But no, no, baby, give me that. A lot of companies were affected, uh, as well as was mine, and uh, I was laid off. No, come on, sit down, Josiah. I was laid off in um, February, the end of February of um, 2002. And uh, it was at that time that I decided that I wasn't going to go back, right? Um, now, if I kind of go back, there are some things that overlapped. What overlapped is that when I was in graduate school, my father would... Um, he would send me information about real estate investing, and I would also attend these different seminars with him where I began to learn about how to uh, negotiate with, with banks, with uh, people whose homes were in foreclosure, and, you know, find, find nuggets of gold in, in what appeared to be, you know, penniless situations. And I would go to these seminars while I was in grad school, you know, 21, 20 years old, and I would see these people set up in the front of the room. And my, this isn't network marketing, right? This is straight real estate investing. I didn't really know anything about network marketing at that point. And these people are getting in the front of the room, Dave, and they're like, oh, yeah, um, I did a deal last month, and I made $50,000, right? And they're breaking down their whole thing, and they're bringing proof. They're bringing closing statements, they're bringing, right? And, oh, then it's a kid that's like 25. And he's like, oh, yeah, I did a deal, and I made $30,000 dollars last month right I'm like what right so this started circulating in my head even though I was you know getting ready to go to work somewhere so when things started kind of um, going crazy for me at the job because I didn't like it right September 11th happened and that was my hey. ended up being my exit once I got laid off but prior hey. to September 11th I was always looking for an out I hated my hours right I worked 12 hour days um, I hated that's right, Pumpkin. I hated the bureaucracy, right, where normally you you would expect that the way they teach it, right, the way they teach it is you go to school and the higher your degrees, the more attractive you are, right? And so you attain all this debt to get the higher degrees, to, to be the one that they hire and all this. And then when I got there, there were people that were in high school doing the job I was doing, and I was an MBA. Right? And I'm like, whoa, 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 time out. Something's not right with this. Right? And I internally, it didn't sit with me. Right? I didn't like all of that shenanigans. And so I was trying to find something to do because I wanted to exit anyway. So I started doing the real estate on the side right on my own. And so I would do direct mail. Right? I would, I would buy lists. Thank you, Pumpkin. I would buy lists of um, homeowners that were filed with the county who were in jeopardy, who were in default, and I would uh, mail them letters, and then they would respond. And the people that responded, I would call them, set up appointments to speak with them, and then they would either agree to work with me or not. So when I got laid off, even though I was doing that part-time, that became my uh, ability to, uh, present the opportunity for me to do that full-time. So I sh shifted it's doing the real estate business full time and so then I took um, I had unemployment and then I had a nice severance package from from the company and I started I using that to I fund don't touch I baby to to start funding my marketing even more right uh, so that was here in Atlanta then in um, July of 2002 my mother was diagnosed with cancer she was back in Chicago so August I packed my car drove Yay. back Okay, look, he knows how to take his own picture because mommy's always doing selfies and stuff. So he's got the camera. He's like, cheese. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> look, he's just, okay, computer kid. Um, so I moved back to Chicago to take care of my mom. Now, one of the things that I was grateful for about that day is that um, I didn't have to ask anybody for time off. 
Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, listen, you got to tend to your family. I'm an only child. So there, there's no sister. There's no brother. My parents were divorced, right? There's no husband. There, it's me. It's me. And so I needed to go back to be with my mom. And I didn't have to worry about, oh, am I going to lose my job? Or, oh, what's going to happen? Or, oh, no income. I'd already started doing something to provide an income that I could also do in Chicago, right? Because it's nothing but getting the list out there and starting the process again, which is what I was able to do. So I was able to be there with my mom. I was able to be there with my mom. And then subsequently, um, she passed in, she's passed March 2nd, 2003. Um, but it was one of those situations where I don't regret a thing because I was really there every moment. There was no phone call that said, oh, here's a tragedy, right? It was, man, it was such, um, it's hard to explain uh, someone has never lost a parent, but to lose a parent, but and they transition with their hand in your hand, you know, it's like, man, that's the best way, you know. And I was able to move on with my life and my business uh, without any regrets. Turn this down, baby. Without any regrets, uh, and it, it allowed me to propel in my business. So I went full fledged into the real estate business, and um, then I ended up uh, getting married. Uh, to my high school sweetheart back at home in Chicago and uh, we did that business together and we did well I mean from 2003 through 2006 early 2007 well 2006 things were good things were really good I mean we were two or three deals a month you know average of thirty forty thousand dollars per deal right I mean it was great I built a house you know we had cars we had jewelry we had all this this stuff and you know it was cool because we were like, you know, mid twenties, you know, late twenties, um, and so it was good. And then, but we never—I don't know. You know how you just never think the good times are gonna ever stop. You know, it's like, oh man, this is great. Why would anybody ever stop doing this? Well, we figured out real quick when the government realizes that the small person is making money, and it was designed for only the powers to be to make money, right? The whole Wall Street thing and the way that they were giving these loans and whatever. When the small guy started making money, they changed everything, right? They changed the laws, they changed the rules, uh, and they made it a lot more difficult for us, of regular people, to be able to close our financial transactions. So uh, a lot of our properties in the pipeline, we weren't able to close them. We had three deals the whole year of 2006, as opposed to two or three per month. So everything started to crash and burn. Naturally, our house went into foreclosure. The cars went into repossession. Um, we filed bankruptcy twice, once to just try to keep the house out of going to sale, and the second time because we really couldn't pay for stuff because we were using credit cards to live off of, right? Um, and then in 2007, a good friend of mine introduced me to home-based business, my first network marketing company. It's a travel deal. And uh, I signed up right away, like on a credit card, because my thing was I had been I had been self-employed at this point in time for um, almost two, three, four, five, six, almost five years, right? And there was just no way I was going back. I just, I couldn't imagine it. I had the, fr I mean, the freedom to go when I wanted, where I wanted, you know, I was in control of what deals we did, what deals we didn't do, what home on, you know, we had too much control of our own car for me to then just hand over the, the steering wheel to somebody else and say, hey, drive this thing for me wherever you want me to go. I'll just sit over here and just take what I can take. I just, that, I, and so what happened is during this, well, let me go back. Before I got introduced to the network marketing company, during that period of time, you know, I was a little lost because I was educated. Um, I had been successful in things that I had done. I didn't really skip any steps. You know, I wasn't a bad child. I hadn't hurt anybody or, you know, abandoned a child. You know, I hadn't done anything wrong society, from the basis of what society would say is wrong. And um, went to school. I, mean, I was just like, this doesn't, this doesn't add up. And so if someone like me that's kind of like on a straight and narrow ends up like this, Mm -hmm. Anybody else who had any challenges or who had a record or you know anything like that, it I just don't see how the system could work for them. It wasn't working for the straight and narrow girl, right? So anyway, uh, I, I would cry at night. I would sit on the stairs in my house and just you know, as I think about it, I remember it was like yesterday. Like God, why is this happening to me? You know, why is this happening to me? What what am I supposed to be doing? You know, and so I get introduced to the network marketing. Get going in that. Uh, and for me, I didn't have anything to lose, you know, because what else was I going to do? Go punch a clock? 
TikTok? That wasn't an option, right? Um, anything short of like, from my perspective, going and selling my body, <laughs> I was willing to do, right? Like, I gotta get out here and get it. Anything but go back to work, you know? Um, so I started the business. I figured it's not that difficult to do. I could talk to people I knew. I could share opportunity, let them look at a presentation. If they liked it, they liked it. If they didn't, they didn't. And I kind of got the ball rolling with that and started making money. But the thing was, the money I was making was not enough to pay all the past due payments. It was enough to from this day forward, but not to go backwards. You know, I wasn't going to throw good money after bad money, right? Just the house had been evaluated. It was $200,000 less at this point in time when they did an appraisal. It just didn't make any sense, right? So um, my ex husband and I at that time, we just decided to let the house go, right? It was brick and mortar. Did we have some emotional attachment? Yeah, I mean, that was our first house. We built it, you know, but um, it's brick and mortar. We could have another house. There's no point in trying to maintain this facade and be broke as hell at the same time, right? So we let the house go. Um, we ended up kind of getting rid of some of the properties that we had, uh, and then we just didn't do any more, and then we moved back down to Atlanta because I wanted to be down here. My dad was still down here. Got back down here, um, kept the real estate thing going a little bit. He was doing that, and then I kind of got more in-depth into Internet marketing, right? Now, right before we moved back here, um, I found the Internet which was like 2008. I found the internet and my goal at that time was to just automate myself. I was tired of running around town. That was my biggest thing. I loved the industry. I loved what we could do. But it, it's Chicago, you know, I mean it's a little bit different than like South Africa, right? Chicago, it's like the snow <laughs> is up to your eyeballs in the winter. Um, literally it takes you 30 minutes to warm up your car. You have to put on a freaking snowsuit, right? It, put on a dress or a skirt. Then you got to drive me where everything from Minnesota. So. <laughs> oh my God, you know exactly then, right? So you, you got to prepare to get somewhere. Like it takes an hour to just prepare. Then you drive there, uh, driving five miles an hour. Then you get there, you have to unleash all this stuff, you're wet, you got to change out of your boots into your heels, right? You're dripping over somebody's house. Um, then you get there and it's like one person sitting there ready to hear this presentation. And I'm like, y'all, I just drove. It took me two hours to get over here, right? And it's one person. And the one person is your cousin who's doing you a favor, right, by watching it. And they're eating the crackers and they're drinking the juice, the cookies. They could care less about what I'm here to talk about. And I said, there's got to be a better way. And I went to the internet to automate my processes because I was tired of that, right? So that's when I started learning about things that um, that we use now, like a blog, um, like autoresponders, like uh, uh, lead capture pages, all those types of things were those tools and the requirements of being online, those were all new to me. I didn't know. It was a whole different world, a whole different language. So I began to kind of teach myself that and study under the tutelage of uh, guys like uh, Dagan Smith, who was my very first mentor online, and, um, and began to start to master some of these, these skills. So then we fast forward to um, 2000, uh, late 2009, and then I met a guy. Oh, Josiah, you can't call people. Look, he's he's calling Aaron Rashkin on my phone. Really? Don't do that, Josiah. Don't do that. Don't call don't call that. Okay. So um so I started um I lost my train of thought. So what did I think I just said? Two thousand nine you met. Okay, so two thousand nine, um I met a guy through a webinar, essentially, right? So I was a leader. Uh, on a leadership council, this particular system at that time, and at, at, by this point, I was probably making about eight thousand dollars a month, right? In between, just like don't call anyone. Thank you. I'm gonna lock the phone. How about that? So I was making somewhere between, <laughs> you know, I don't know, it was five to eight thousand a month, right? But I couldn't seem to get past that, right? I think I made ten thousand dollars one time, and that's because I created and sold my own products. Right, and we did that in like a night. Right, that was my first time ever making five figures or whatever. Um, that was 2010. That was actually February 2010. Um, but 2009, I was kind of struggling to get past this hump, and so um, met this guy on this webinar. He came into the system that we were in, and at that time he was I know baby he was homeless, right? And he's kind of started learning this stuff. Uh, and next thing you know, we get on the webinar, and he makes like 12 grand on this webinar, right? 
And I was like, who in the world is this guy? Right? We didn't know anything about him or where he was from. But we bef I befriended him. We became friends on Skype. Um, and his name was David Wood, right? So so then we um, we were just staying until we were in different companies. And we never worked together directly or anything. And um, but, but we would chat over Skype every now and again. And we both had a passion for the people at the end of the day. That was what it was really, right? Always trying to create stuff for our teams. Always trying to create systems or processes or how can my team just take what I have and use it? You know, that was always there. Okay, okay, what do you want? You want Sesame Street? Let's go back to Sesame Street. Hold on, hold on, guys. I got, I got to get Sesame Street That's on. That's okay. You're taking time. Um, look, Stinky's first day of preschool. Let's start over. Okay. He turned it down. Okay, uh, so uh, we just really wanted to help the people more than anything. And um, lo and behold, we kind of kept doing what we were doing, and then we had a conference that we were both speaking at, right? Uh, this was October of um, 2011. Well, we spoke together at different conferences, but by 2011, um, we were both speaking, and he was, he was, um, he had received a, a, a large bonus, and... Um, the big check. And he was sure, like a big check, right? Here's the big check, a big bonus check. And so he spoke, I spoke, and um, he was, you know, he stopped me in the hall. Or actually, at that time, um, his business partner David Sharp stopped me in the hallway and said, you know, Trace, want to talk to you about something. And I know it's kind of busy this weekend, but you know, we should, we got to get together. I said, okay, that's fine. I said, you know, I'm a little tired. Like we're running around this event. So, okay, well, let's get together when we everybody gets home, and let's just kind of Skype, and we'll talk it, what, talk about it, whatever. So that's what we did. We got back home. That was in Orlando. Josiah, no. No, no, no. No. And then we uh, got on Skype, and that's when they basically introduced um, what we now know as Empower Network, right? They had introduced that to me, the concept of it. Um, and at that time, it was like the website. There was no website yet. There was nothing. It was really just the idea of, hey, it's going to be a blogging platform, right? I was a blogger already, right? David was a blogger already. And the deal was if he could duplicate what he was doing with blogging, then he could help people make what he was making. That was the idea, right? Like duplicating something for a team. Uh, so I was on board right away and um, began kind of marketing it, talking to people in my warm market, other network marketers. Uh, and then that was that – was, that was um, September. No, that was early October. That was October the 26th of 2011 when I officially signed up because I had to take my form and uh, email it, <laughs> right? Scan it and email it back to them at that time because the site didn't work, right? So um, yeah, they shut down. That, well, it hadn't even got going yet. It just wasn't okay. ready. Now, if you guys have over have heard the story where Dave was talking about. The oh, you know what? It was broken. It was you know the story where Dave talks about the coder and he didn't know what was going on. Yeah. Well, that that simultaneously happening when people like me, Lawrence Tam, you know, all of us are signing up at that period of time, right? The site was broken. I'm sorry, you were absolutely correct. Yeah. And um, it's like this is a great movie, you know, to be able to take all these pieces, right? So we Don't didn't make worry the movie about it. it. We just yeah, you know, I figured they can make a movie called The Social Network. Right, they could definitely make a movie about what we're doing, right? Yeah. Somebody in Hollywood. Anyway, uh, so we just believed in Dave, you know, both both the days at that time. We believed in them. Um, I didn't believe that because the site didn't work, it was a scam, right? I didn't think because I just knew them. It was just they were affiliates like us. They weren't corporate guys that bought and sold network marketing companies and had large budgets and funds and venture capitalists. This, these are two guys like me and you who decided, hey. Let's just start a company because there's nothing else out there that does what we want it to do. So they're on their kitchen table. They're buying software. They don't know what the hell they're buying, right? Just think if you were going to do it right now, what would you do? Go to Google and type up stuff. That's what they were doing. And um, they, they, they leveraged their friends, you know what I'm saying, people who trusted them. And, and that's who we were initially. And, and so that stuff didn't really bother me, you know, like that was happening. It was just like, well, we'll get it fixed out. We'll get it figured out, you know. In the meantime, everybody, let's. Let's go. Let's go. You know, and that's kind of how Empower Network started from that. St I know, baby. How it started from that that standpoint. My first month in Empower Network, um, I earned over twenty seven thousand dollars. And if you remember, like I said before, I was struggling to get past eight. 
on a consistent basis, right? So something that David Wood teaches is that um, stuck is stuck. Right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether it's $8,000 a month. If you're at a job and you're making $3,000 a month and you want more, stuck is stuck. Right? If you're not at working a job at all and you want a job, stuck is stuck. Right? It doesn't matter what level of stuckness you're at. It's if you want to get to the next level and you can't seem to do it, you're stuck. Right? And, and I wanted to progress. And so when, when that happened that first month, I knew we were on to something. Right, I knew there was a demand or there was a need for it. We began to promote more and more and more. And um, within the first 27 months, then I was able to um, earn um, my first million dollars in in commission. Right now, you know, when I look back on it, it's like, oh, that seems like it was so amazing. But you know, during that time, I wasn't thinking about, oh, I want to be the first female million dollar earner, right? At that time, it's just my head is down and we're working. We're making sales, we're working. We're leveraging each other, we're helping people, we're getting things going. I didn't really recognize that I needed to get into the million dollars until like, I don't know, because I think Dave and the Dave's hit it, then we had like Tony Rush hit it, or then Vic hit it. These are people, right? Um, then Lawrence Tam or somebody, or I don't know the exact order, I can't remember, but Lawrence Tam somewhere in there hit it, right? Then um, I think Shakir hit it, right? So right around Shakir, I was like, okay, <laughs> wait a minute. Obviously, I need to be hitting this goal, right? Before, I was not concerned with it. Now, I was probably at around, uh, I don't know, seven or 800,000 around that time, if I had to guess, right? Um, so head down focused got me to like, 800,000 or something. And then when I realized that I really, really wanted to hit it, then I kind of started paying attention, right? Then we turned around and then Justin Varengia, Justin and D hit it, right? I'm like, okay, that's it. Not one more person is going to hit it before I hit it, right? So then it became competitive, like friendly competition because the, then you start questioning, well, what the hell wrong with me, right? I know I can do it. There's nothing wrong with me. Um, I, maybe I'm just not focusing on doing it, right? And then I made a decision in my mind that that's what I wanted to do. Uh, and then it happens, right? And then it happened. And then, you know, we broke people right after that. And, you know, Chuck Marshall, Aaron Rashkin, right? Alex and Anna Zubarov just did it. Uh, quite a few other people did. We think we have like 15 people at this point in time. You get people like um, uh, Toby and Layla Black now that are not that far from it. You got Mike Hobbs that's not that far from it. You got Rob Ford that's like $90,000 away from it, right? I mean, I mean, the people are lined up at the door, right, to break, to cross this threshold. It's, and you think, well, if it's $1 million earner, it's like, okay, yeah, that's great. But when you got 15 people with like maybe another handful knocking at the door, if you are any type of um, reasonable business-minded person, you have to sit down and ask yourself, man, what in the world are they doing, right? How is this working? And can this possibly work for me? Of course, none of us can guarantee it, but man, 15 to 20 or 20 potential you know, different people, different walks of life, different backgrounds, different religions, different races, different genders, you know, everybody, some people are married, some people are single, you know, um, I was pregnant at the time, right, I mean, some people already had kids, some people didn't have kids at all, it was, there's too many differences to say, oh, the only reason why they did it is because of this, right, they can put, yeah. the, you can't put your finger on it, it's just, the system works yeah, for those so, who work yeah, so. It's that ever, um, you know, everyone's asking, what is the actual secret? You know, people are always saying, what is that secret that you're actually doing? And uh, it's, there isn't actually a secret. It's not. It's, it's, it's this. It's the focus and the consistency um, of what? Of, from in our standpoint, it's, it's this. It's getting traffic to a page, enough of it, that then turns into leads. You get enough leads that turn into sales and enough sales every day that generate you per day what you want increasingly, which then gets you to what you want per month, right, which then over time compounds itself and you play the time game and then it gives you a, a total amount, right? That That's all it is. Um, now, are there a lot of intricate details in the middle of that and how to perfect it and, you know, synchronize all these moving, these moving parts? Yeah. But the gist of it, it's not rocket science or brain surgery at all. It's 
you already got a web page. The company gives us the web page. All you do is get people to look at the web page. The web page and everything that happens after the web page kind of does a lot of the hard selling for us. And then our goal is to follow up with people, build a relationship, connect with them, let them know we're not a scam, let them know that we're real people with a real desire. Stop, Josiah. No. Don't pull that chair. With a real desire to help. Um, and we're not trying to just take, you know, their $17 and run off into the sunset and, and buy our multi-million dollar mansions with their $17, right? It's, that's not what we're looking to do. And um, over time, people see the consistency and, and they get going. They get going, and I, that's been that's been the formula to my success, you know. And and so therefore, I believe in that, and I know that it can work. I've seen it work for tons of people, and not everybody wants to make a million dollars, you know. That's fine. Some people just want to make an extra three to five thousand a month, right? At least here in the states, where you are, I don't know what the conversions are with that, but you know, we were talking a little bit earlier, you know, maybe it's an extra five hundred dollars or something like that, right? Extra thousand dollars, I don't know, but. But no matter what the level is or what the desire is, Empower Network can help people do that, right? And I just so believe in what we're doing that I'm just not going to stop, right? Just I just can't. It's just, why would I, I? It's it's one of the the themes. I mean, as as we're listening to your story now, the one thing that is prevalent throughout it is that you didn't have a I'm not going to stop attitude. You didn't have a you you were going to do it no matter what. I yeah. do remember when. I first got started with this business. I actually said to my buddy, my best friend at the time, I said, what well, is to my best friend, but I said to him, uh, I said, I'm going to be doing this business. And he looked at me and he says, well, you should try it for six months and then, you know, to a year. And if it doesn't work, move on to something else. And because I had generated a relationship with my sponsor, or, you know, with, with Ryan Maynard, he, uh, and I knew it was real, I said to him, I'm going to do this until I die. Mm -hmm. And 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 even though I was you know joking so to speak, I wasn't ready because I was going to do this no matter what, and uh, that is something that everybody I feel needs to have. They need to have this. I'm not going to stop until I succeed. And uh, you're a great example of that because I mean, even from the beginnings where and I've seen it. I've seen you know these banners in the malls that say you know get a degree or get this so you can earn more money and that just seems to be a theme that the world teaches you that if you're going to be earning more money you have to be you you you've got to get a better degree but in fact you don't need that at all it's got nothing to do with that i mean nothing. in fact the more money you spend on a degree i mean that that doesn't mean anything you yeah. know it's like what does that mean? It means you spent more money on a degree. <laughs> there's no, yeah, there's no income disclaimer. Yeah, and I, and I just think, you know, for what, what it would cost to get all of our educational products here at Empower Network, um, you know, U.S. dollars, you know, about $5,000. I mean, really, um, you know, if you were going to go and, and get an education that you were actually going to use at a university, mm -hmm. it costs you, you know, Ten times that, you know what I'm saying? It costs you ten times that, uh, and then nobody is saying that the information that you're learning is actually usable, right? It's it's nobody cares because you still got to go and interview, you still got to go and prove yourself to people just because you know it. So what? Nobody's ever done anything, and then you got to start at the bottom still, right? You got to work your way, and what in the world? I mean, people don't have that type of time, and in today's society, it's just, it's not the way it is. You know, real quick, I, I used to, in one of the companies I was in, hold on one second, look, look, he, see, he's got his ball stuck over here, right? right. And That's so right. I have to go get the ball. Hold Good on. Good. That's all right. Uh, here's the ball. Here, baby. Don't put it back up there for mommy, okay? Keep it down there. So you can play. All right. So there was a presentation that I would do, um, and one of the components of the presentation talks about the different ages, like the industrial age, the agricultural age, um, the information age, right? These time periods uh, in society, and it talks about how, you know, during the agricultural age, most people had to learn um, agriculture, right? Because that's 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 what was that's what was in demand, and that's what paid people, right, to know how to farm, to know how to do those things, how to procure the food, the raw material, and, you know, and do that. That's what people had to do. But then we shifted into the industrial age, right? Now we didn't need the people to do that anymore because we had machines, 
So then what did people do? People went into working in the plants. The plants yeah, yeah. then operate the machines. So you didn't need to know how to do agriculture. You needed to know how to operate machinery, right? So the, the, the learning, the knowledge had to shift, right? Then, uh, you know, we, we've moved down to the information age. Right? And so a lot of that physical labor that a lot of people had gotten used to because of the industrial age, like my grandfather was in the industrial age, right? I mean, this is like in the 30s and 40s, right? 1930s and 40s, in this age, and, and this is what they know. Now, the, the crazy thing is because they were in the industrial age, guess what they taught their kids, right? So that's yeah. like my dad, right? Guess what they taught their kids? They only taught them industrial type stuff. So go to work, go to work, go to work, go to work, right? Get a good job. That's all they knew, but it was relevant to the time, right? Now, what happens? You've got people like my parents who started teaching me that same thing, which was outdated. They weren't doing it on purpose, right? But that's all they knew. It's outdated information. They're teaching us to do stuff that we're in the information age. And now the, the skills that one needs is not how to operate machinery or how to do stuff in a manual labor perspective. It's how to consume information and how to then be able to turn this information into some type of physical result, right? You learn something, which is what the premise of college is, right? You go and learn it, but the, the, the scam about it is Nobody is saying that if you take this and you apply this exact formula and you do it over time, these are going to be your results. It's too many different moving parts. And so then people spend 50, 60,000. Some of the Ivy League colleges, I mean, 100,000. I've got friends that have doctors, went to medical school, $250,000 in debt, right? Now they're working. They love being doctors, but they never have any time. They're always busy, right? They, some, a couple of them want to be married with kids, they can't date <laughs> yeah. because they work too freaking much, right? They're 40 years old, it's nothing happening, right? No prospects, no kids, no nothing. And you look up and your life is passing you by for what? And you're still in debt. You know, there's no quality of life there. And I just, that disheartens me, right? Because that's what's still being taught. And if we are living proof that the times have changed, we cannot keep teaching that. Right. Um, and so as a result, as you said, it's like you're going to do it until you die. That's right. I mean, God forbid that that happens to Empower Network, but uh, while it's here, while it's here for the next 20 years or 30 years or however long we can make this thing last and sustain it and help generations of people. You know, I want to be around for my son. My son's 17 months, right? He sees what I'm doing every single day. I want to be able to teach him this and pass it on to him so he can be self-sufficient. Right? Not, oh, he's 16, he got to go get a job. No, he's 16, he needs to start a business. <laughs> it's, amazing <laughs> how many, it's amazing how many people don't, don't see that. Even uh, my generation, some of them are thinking that. And it's, it's such a, a different way of thinking that getting support for doing this type of business can be incredibly difficult. And that, that's why we have products like the Inner Circle to help us and to motivate us and to teach us. Um, but you know, Tracy, what I want what I want to do now is I know that um, Stephen and Katie are dying to ask you a question, and I wanted to know if, uh, if uh, Katie, if you want to go first, I know you want to ask uh, uh, Tracy something. I like, okay, I like this question. I think it's an exciting question, and it's really simple. So, what was it like when you got your first sale? My you know first sale. Mean? Did you see the smile on her face? <laughs> You know, well, for me, it was a little different because, see, my first sale with our company, um, it wasn't my first sale online, right? So it's a little different. For, for me, my thing wasn't the first sale. For me, it was like it was the first time I had made five figures in a month without having to create a product. Right, that because my angle was different. Right, I was already online. I was already like I was already making between five and eight thousand a month. So, so at the time, Empower launched. I wasn't coming to the internet like, oh my goodness, it it can this work? Can this work? I already knew it could. It was more or less, could we really help a lot of people? Could I help more than just me? Right, it was that. So I will tell you if anything. 
when I started seeing my team get their first sales, right? Now that for me was way more impactful because I had struggled previously in helping people get their first sale, right? In network marketing, it's not the easiest thing to do, especially the traditional way. And to see people come online and like make two or three sales a day, oh my goodness, you're talking about excitement, you're talking about elation, you're talking about jumping up and down, you're talking about getting on the phone with the other leaders like, oh my God, it's working, it's working, oh my God, yes, yes, people, right? I had team members that were paying their mortgage, right? It's not just like it's a big deal, but it is in our industry, right? They're paying their mortgage. I get team members that went and bought new cars, right? Because they had kids where their older cars were too small to fit you know, all three car seats, because we're talking about kids under three, right? Fit car seats, three of them in a back seat comfortably, right? Needing a larger SUV and to be able to take the commissions from what they had earned from Empower Network and go do that. Uh, I had seen people quit their jobs, right? Walk away confidently. I'm out of here, you know? Seeing that on a larger scale, because it wasn't just me, it wasn't just my team, it was people all throughout the company in different countries, right? People like um, 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 Marisol Dennis, who was, you know, funding her cancer treatments, right? Funding her cancer treatments with her commissions. Um, people who were getting surgeries, of, oh, good, I, I, it slips my, my mind right now because I'm getting so excited, but she was in Australia. Right, and she was laying on her back, and she um, she had a disease where literally um, a spinal disease, where she, huh? Christina Munoz. Christina, yes, Christina Munoz. She had a spinal disease where she could only sit up or stand up for all of 15 minutes at a time before she started to experience great pain, right? And so she would lay on her side in the bed and do this business. And she started to earn enough money at that point in time to actually get the surgery she needed. And she actually was able to come to her first event, which I believe was um, Denver, right? We were in Denver and she got to her first event. I met her and literally everybody was in tears, right? Um, because of what it cost her to pay for the surgery, if it hadn't been for Empower Network, she would have never gotten the surgery, right? It changed her life. So to see those types of things, Katie, would probably be a little bit more, I don't know, relative for me um, than the first, oh, oh, you changed the screen, baby, don't do that. Okay, there we are, sorry. Um, than the first sale um, for me personally, because it was really about, like I said, me and Dave were always passionate about helping the team helping the team how can we help the team go and this was the time that we realized this we finally got something to help the team so that was life-changing and I knew I had planted my flag and that was just gonna be it that was it wasn't anything else out there like it and it's still not one of, one of the things that uh, I remember you saying or I remember Dave saying about you is that when, even when uh, the system was shut down and you had that video playing over and over and over again <laughs> you would go to your team and you would say, right, just uh, do your blogs anyway on like Word and just type them out. Yeah. And that was such a good idea. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's really, you know, because, I mean, I, you know, Tracy, you've got a great reputation for working with your team and working really closely with your team. And I've learned a tremendous amount from that um, from you. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, that it's something we can all learn from. And, um, uh, getting on that, I've got to go on to the next person, that's Steve, and Steve wants to ask you a question. Uh, go for it, Steve. Yeah, man, I actually got this question in my email as well, so okay, I, thought, yeah. I thought I'd ask it. Uh, what was your main aha moment or breakthrough in this industry that made you realize that this is, a, this is awesome, this is what you want to do for the, for the long term, and uh, your main breakthrough or aha moment, basically? Okay, well, that's a good question. For me, that happened when I was doing offline. I hadn't even gotten online yet, right? So this okay. was like 2007, um, beginning of 2008, and I would actually do presentations at my company, you know, in front of rooms of people. And um, I would see people listen to me talk about a life they could have, um, talk about income that was life-changing income but was, that was more than what they were making per year, right? I, I could look in people's eyes and, and know that they really wanted this, right? And then in those live environments, 
after the presentation is over, I would sit down and talk to some of them, right? People that would get started and find out a little bit more about what they wanted to do. And I began to hear stories. I began to hear people actually start to consider a dream again, right? Actually say, you know, well, if I could actually retire my wife, that would be a cool thing. Huh? If yeah. I could buy that car or take my family on a vacation, I would go here, right? And just a glimmer, a glimmer of hope of a dream that had pre previously been suppressed, to see that in people's eyes, in their faces, in their overall being, I knew, Stephen, that this is where I needed to be. It was my calling for me to be able to speak this information to people, what was yeah. unknown, to make them aware. I knew I had to keep saying this it was like the good news, right? For people that are Christians, right? It's like yeah. the good news, right? For me, it was the good news. It was it was the unheard secret. It's the world of business that doesn't require you to buy a McDonald's that costs you one point five million dollars that nobody has except for the top, you know, three percent of people. Um, it's like, man, I could have a business too, and this five hundred dollar business at that time could grow to sixty thousand a month, seventy thousand a month. How, you know? That, I knew this is what I had to do. This was my calling when I could look at those people's faces and they were believing in me. They were believing. Yeah. And I was like, I got to keep doing it and got to keep going because right now they don't believe in themselves. They're believing that what I'm saying, they're trusting what I'm saying as, as the gospel in that sense, right? That's the truth. And unless I can keep providing results and show that others are getting results, I'm going to lose the people. I'm going to lose them. And the only way I can keep Showing results is to keep going, and so that's what it would. That's what it is. That's you know, awesome. If if um, I have a question that I want to ask you, and uh, uh, I think it's I think you'd be the best person to answer this because you've had a lot of experience uh, being where you are. But if you could perhaps point out some of the mistakes you made in the beginning, things that that actually hindered you in your progression. Um, with doing this business in particular. Um, perhaps some warning signals that you could say to people, look, don't do this uh, because this isn't going to help you. Um, I don't know if you, if you want to speak on that. Um, sure. You know, something that I learned in my real estate business that I was able to bring over to this was don't spend all your money. <laughs> right. Don't freaking spend all your money. So. So I didn't make that mistake in this business, but I made the mistake in business, and I was able to bring that teaching over here. So when you make $27,000 in a month, right, the tendency is to say, oh my God, right, let me go out and buy this. Let me go do that, right? You're trying to compensate for all the things you wanted as quickly as you can, right? And I would say, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, you've got to structure your, your money um, in a way that allows you to simultaneously enjoy fruits of your labor while you plant seeds for the future, um, while you are able to still live below your means, right? And, and so you can build up enough where it's so much more than what you need that you're fine, right? If you want to splurge that you could. Um, so I would just say that's the first thing is, you know, I know people can make, I know people can make five figures a month, right? Strong five figures a month here as a new person, as a newbie. And let me just say, we've talked a little bit about money here, so see our income disclosure because results are not typical. Um, our income disclosure at uh, empowernetwork.com forward slash income. But I know it's possible. I can't guarantee it, but I know it's possible Bye. for people to make a six-figure income here. Um, and so if you're making $10,000 a month and you've never made that before, right? You've made three or four or less. It's pretty tempting. It's pretty tempting. Um, and so that would be the first thing. Don't spend all your money. The second thing um, that, that I did um, have to learn in this industry is to say, stop sitting that. The other thing that I did learn in this industry is that uh, coming from a, a business where I was a boss, right, because I had employees in my real estate business, I had, uh, that this is not, um, these are not your employees, right? People that, that you build with, that you build your team with, they don't work for you. So you can't threaten them if they don't come to the conference call or the training, you're going to cut their check 
or are you going to kick them out? Right? You can't do that. Uh, I had to learn that because these are volunteer, volunteer people, and you have to inspire people to take action as opposed to using fear-based tactics, which is what you, the job arena does. You know, if you don't come to work, your check gets docked. The only reason why people go is because they don't want their check to get docked. It doesn't mean they love what they do. It means they don't want their check to get docked, right? So it's fear-based. Um, so, so leading, the way that I would lead, I had to learn that and shift the way that I would um, communicate and uh, disseminate information and the expectations that I would, sorry, I don't do that. The expectations that I would set on the organization had to shift a little bit. Um, and one other thing I would say from the standpoint of um, mistakes would be um, don't get to don't get too relaxed. In other words, if you found yourself in a, a good little rhythm, right? Like something that you're like a daily method of operation. I call it a daily move, right? A daily method of operation. And so let's just say you get up. Let's just say you go to work, right? Do everything you got to do. You go to work, you come home, and you're doing this business part time. And you may have two hours, right? You get yourself into a rhythm where you come home, you you might write an ad, you might send out an ad, or do some paid advertising. You might write a blog post, something to communicate with your list, right? Send that out to your list, um, and then you might start eliciting feedback from your list. So now you're doing social media. Right, you're communicating with your team, and this is what you're doing in your two hours. When you start to make money, don't stop doing that thing. Right? Don't stop doing the thing that got you to where you were, uh, where you were at a point making the money. Because then what happens is you get complacent, and you're like, oh, I didn't do that. So then you start overseeing. Right now, you're back to the boss. Right? You're overseeing everybody, and you're managing everybody. And and before you know it, your income is looking a little suspect, right? Like, wait a minute, what happened? Well, it's because you stopped the income-producing activities with the vigor that you had previously because you started making a little bit of money and your ego probably got in the way, right? And I'm not saying you're out there like, oh, I'm the best person ever. But just you know your ego got in the way. You know you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You, you just what, – you just – Waiting for the check to come the next week. You didn't do nothing this week, but you know the check is coming, right? So I would say don't do that because what happened is that I, I had a lot of team members that experienced um, downfall, you know, because our company, like any other company, had gone through, you know, a couple of points in the valley, right? And when the company, when companies go through growing pains, if you don't have your ducks lined in a row, especially if you've made money during the times the company was at a peak, then then you're setting yourself up to fail and not be able to sustain the storm, right? Um, because you're going to go through it. There's going to be storms. There's just no way it's not going to be a storm. So don't make the mistake of anticipate or not anticipating a storm. <laughs> you know. Pack your nuts away for the winter, in other words, <laughs> okay, right? Store your, store your nuts for the winter mm -hmm. so that if you need to, if it gets too cold to go outside and you can't go out there, you got food, That's you know? Right. That's the concept. So those would be the things I would say. Right. You know, um, there is this one question that I get from a lot of people, uh, as, uh, particularly with blogging, and we were talking about this, all three of us, um, well, yeah, all three of us, about when you do a blog, and now, we often told by a lot of people, blog about anything, all right? So, you know, your passion. So if you blog about butterflies, you know, just blog about butterflies. But the problem is, <laughs> it does seem to be a, a, a small confusion because I know that when you blog, to actually do it effectively, you've got to blog about solutions. So you, and then, you know, people have problems, so you blog about a solution, how they can solve that problem. So, so what would I guess what I'm asking is what is the balance between doing a blog about what you're passionate about and blogging about solutions to people's problems, if if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, the thing is, if what you're passionate about, other people want to be able to do that thing full time, or do that thing too, or be better at that thing then there's always problems associated with almost any passion, right? So you mentioned if your thing is butterflies, well, 
There are people that love butterflies, but if they struggle with catching butterflies or evaluating butterflies or collecting butterflies or where to go and study butterflies, right? All these, I mean, I, I just off the top of my head. I, I mean, these are things that butterfly enthusiasts are looking for, right? And so you can blog about butterflies, but it's, it's not just, oh my goodness, my favorite butterfly is the yellow with blue stripes and they fly so beautifully and it's not that, right? It's okay, listen, if you love blue and yellow butterflies um, and you've been trying to collect them, let me show you the top five resources uh, in the world where you can go to actually see them yourself, right? Or tap into them yourself or something like that, you know, that would be it. So what I advise people to do usually is um, always with blog, I call it, you know, 10, 10, 10, which is find 10 problems that your market has. Josiah, stop that. Find 10 problems that your market has. Then come up with 10 solutions, a, a solution for every problem. And then you write a blog post with one solution and one, one problem for all 10 of those problems and solutions, which is 10 blog posts. Right, so 10 problems, 10 solutions equals 10 pieces of content. And, and that should help people get going, right, um, with blogging. So it can be about whatever, but it has to be, like you said, solution, problem and solution oriented. Otherwise, people are just, they don't know what it has to do with them, right? It's, it's a nice piece to read, but it has nothing to do with how their life has been enhanced by reading your content. And that's what we're looking to do. I mean, Kalatu in itself means to tell a story, right? I mean, that's the name of our blogging place. It means to tell a story. And so tell a story. You know, <laughs> tell something useful, something valuable. You want, when people, when people walk away, Josiah, when, you, when people walk away from reading your content, you want them to walk away feeling better than they did or feeling more value, feeling they have more value as a result of being in contact with you than before they came in contact with you. And that is the whole building a relationship part we're talking about, right? And enough of that generates trust. And enough trust generates buyers, right? And enough buyers generate sales. And enough sales actually starts to put you on track for your income. And enough income can change your life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it starts with that. It can't be overlooked. It's not... Um, it's not something that people should think about doing. Oh, that's a nice tip. No, it's kind of like the foundation of the whole fortress that we're building, right? Yeah. And so I think it's extremely important. Okay, great. Um, tell me something, uh, Katie. Do we have any questions from people uh, on the actual uh, comment section that we can ask Tracy? Give it a second. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not seeing any at the moment. I think everybody just wants to sign up again. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, uh, awesome. oh man, <laughs> Tracy, let me let me first of all say that um, it's been such a privilege having you here. Honestly, I'm I'm so glad that you joined us, and even with your busy schedule, I know that you didn't really have the time, but you made the time and made this possible. Thank you so much. We really do appreciate yes. it, and uh, we wish you everything of the best. And you know, because I wanted to meet you when I was in Vegas, but I couldn't oh. find you, and I think I stepped out just at the moment. Uh, because I saw you doing an interview with somebody, and I really just wanted to say, hey, but I, I honestly didn't know that you were there, because I think I stepped out at the wrong moment. But um, I really and honestly am so grateful for you being here. Thank you so much. And I know that I've learned an awful lot. Um, but thank yeah. you so much. So many golden nuggets. Well, thank you, Stephen and <laughs> Dave and, and Katie, you guys. Are, um, are awesome. I, I certainly appreciate you um, and what you're doing. You know, it's you know my belief is my belief, but when collectively we can instill this into others, right? That's this is this is what the point is. It's the the point where we can help people see there's another way, right? And there's a better way. There's a better way. It may seem a little scary because not everybody is doing it. It's the road less traveled, right? But that's just it. The road less traveled is, is where all the opportunity is. If everybody is traveling the same road, they're sucking up all the, you know, all the benefits out of it. It's, you know, this is like the organic, <laughs> right? We've got more nutrients. We've got better energy, vibration, right, from this organic apple than just the other kind. Um, 
And so I appreciate you guys. I mean, all the way, you know, South Africa. I mean, I just think back when we first started, right? And it was just a dream, right? It was just me going off of Dave and what he believed could happen. And to be here four years later, and we have people in almost every country, like 140 countries, you know, that to me is mind blowing. Right, that is mind blowing. How a person can be blessed with a vision, decide to take action on it, and it impacts all of us. Right? What if Dave had just said, "Oh, that's like a good idea, but it's too hard. Screw it." Like we would not even be here. Like how many lives would have not been touched had he, you know, chickened out? Yeah. And um, so I'm always so grateful for him. And then I'm always so appreciative of the people who are, are running with us, who see the vision. And like you said. We're just psychologically unemployable. It ain't nothing else I can do, Dave. I mean, I'm not going back to school. I, 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 you know, I got degrees, but I ain't going back to school. Uh, if anything, I can. I'll buy. I'll buy online education, right? And I'll teach myself how to do what I need to do on the internet. But I'm not going to sit in nobody class. Can't nobody teach me. Look, unless the professor has earned over, you know, five million dollars doing the thing that he or she's teaching me to do. I can't find it credible, right? I can't find it credible because I've got people in my network who earn $30 million doing this, right? Why would I not listen to them? Why would I listen to you, right? Just because you're a professor. Right? No, I can't do it. Yeah. Um, and so I just, I want to encourage people to just, to seek, to seek this information and, and just try, you know? And um, let's see how, much, how many more lives we can help. Oh, absolutely. And you know what? I said to Steve, we're going to have this, uh, we are going to have an Empower Network event in South Africa um, oh, yeah. very, very soon. And it's, uh, it's, we're going to make this happen, absolutely. It's going to happen. No doubt about it. Yeah. Yay! Please do, because listen, I need a reason to come to South Africa, right? What an <laughs> awesome reason it would be. Uh, and I have a couple of, actually, I have a couple of friends in South Africa um, that, um, like, uh, with Johannesburg. Johannesburg, That's yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, she lives there, uh, and and you know she's been here to the states, but I've never been been there. You know, so we still communicate on Facebook, and we're not associated business wise, right? But man, they just show up in South Africa, and be like, hey, girl, right? <laughs> right? I want to be able to do that. So we please we'll get do. it going. Give we us will. a reason to be in South Africa. We will do. We will do. So, Katie, I know that you, I'm Katie, uh, Tracy, I know that uh, you're probably pretty busy and you need to get other things done. Thank you so much, really. Um, and we will hopefully have you on here again uh, sometime yes. in the future. Absolutely. It was definitely a pleasure and a privilege to be on with you and to share this information with um, all of the people watching. And I just wish you all much, much success. Much, much success and uh, prosperity and love and abundance and hope and just fulfilling all of your dreams because I just believe it's, it's true. You can do it. They can come true. All right. So we're going to be signing off now. We're saying goodbye to everybody. Um, you guys want to say goodbye? Goodbye, everybody. Awesome. Bye. Awesome. Thanks, right. everybody, for watching. Cheers.